Well, I guess um, if you didn't already know, you figured out by now that Mama Jimpa is not here today. And if you're disappointed by that, I, I feel for you. And, and if you're disappointed that there's not going to be a big potluck afterwards, I also feel for you. If you're confused as to why Mama Jimpa is not here, well, then you're in the perfect place because today my talk is about confusion. I wanted to be there with you. I expected to be, but I had some unforeseen circumstances at home this morning. So I'm doing this from my home in Loomis. And there is a sort of fringe benefit. And that is I could have my notes right here and you don't even really see that I'm reading from my notes, but I will be reading from my notes a, a bit. Um, so I, I want to introduce myself and my talk a little bit more, but I wanted to first invite you to partake in a short lead meditation. So if you'll get comfortable and assume you're upright yet relaxed posture, we're just gonna do a little contemplation here for a few minutes. Maybe take, start by taking some deep breaths in to settle into a meditative state. Feel the seat beneath you and your feet on the floor if you're sitting with your feet on the floor. I want to invite you to think of a time from the past when you felt confused. Maybe it was a time you were trying to figure something out, maybe some Dharma materials, maybe something at work, or, or maybe a, a little more touchy circumstance where you're confused about an interaction with somebody else or a group of people. Sometimes relationships can cause the most sort of triggering confusion. So is there anyone that doesn't have an instance in mind? Raise your hand if you need a little more time to think of a time. All right, so I invite you to, to return in your mind to that time and that place and think about where you were and who you were with, if you're with somebody or what you were engaging in. And try to really put yourself back in that circumstance and that situation. And, and try to revisit how you felt. Can you imagine the sensations in your body whether you had any distress or what you were contemplating or feeling about it. Just spend another moment or so re-experiencing those sensations. Okay, you can come back to being present to the room and take a couple of deep breaths if you need to. If it was a really frustrating circumstance, shake out your hands or, or do something to let that energy go. And maybe we can just see if anybody would like to share what their situation was or what they remembered about what they felt. Good, because it'll be boring if you just listen to me for the next hour. So please. Hi, Ellen. This is Sue. Can you hear me? I can hear you and see you. Uh, oh, my goodness. This is good. <laughs> anyway, I was quite surprised at um, 
being confused, I never would have related that necessarily to upset and anger, frustration under the anger umbrella. But um, as I sat here thinking about it, it really made me realize when I went back to the situation that a lot of it had to do with the rising of anger, which kind of surprised me. That's it. Yeah, thank you. Who else? I, I, I could say one. Please. I, I yes, I, I think I'm on. The, I uh, I had a conversation on a telephone with with a, a good friend, and um, and I misunderstood my friend, and they misunderstood me, and um, and that caused a lot of confusion to me because I didn't see it coming, you know, I didn't see the problem coming, and uh, and I just am counting on our past history of trust to help us get through it. Is this what you're talking about, yeah, Amanda? Yeah, yeah. Do you remember how you felt? I felt shocked. Mm -hmm. What the person thought I was communicating wasn't what I was thinking, <laughs> you know. And they didn't believe me completely, and I mm -hmm. needed to just let them be, you know. Because yeah. what they were thinking I was communicating would cause me to be mad, too. Mm -hmm. But I, I needed to just let them, you know, have a little time go by. because. That's sometimes the best thing, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else? Hi, Ellen. Good to see you. Good to see you, sort of, yes. Uh, yes. So in the last week, I had a situation come up with my father. And we've always had a wonderful relationship. Um, but he worked a lot when I was growing up. And so it, it was kind of like a distant form of love and affection. And w without going into specifics, he, he kind of admitted something about himself this week that brought up a lot of pain and anger and confusion in me. And it was just very unexpected. And reflecting on it, I, I kind of figured out that the truth of his experience um, didn't line up with the projection of the image I had placed on him, mm -hmm. this imagined self that I had always thought, this is who my dad is. Mm -hmm. And But the more I learned about him, I was like, oh, wow, like who he actually is is aligned with this imagined version of him that I've connected with. And so I had to figure out how to deal with that because there was a lot of anxiety and energy just arising in me and so aligning my how i relate to, to him to who he actually was it was an interesting process of digesting that so mm -hmm. yeah definitely a lot of confusion aligned with that and all came down to my own projections and expectations i'd placed on him so yeah thank you Good. thank you for sharing anybody else Um, so recently, I hello Ellen. Um, Hi. Uh, recently, I had a conversation with a friend who um, admitted to, I guess, betraying me in a very fundamental way. So I felt the confusion of that very poignantly, and a lot of anger, um, and uh, uncertain about whether forgiveness means reconciliation um so that was also a point of confusion so but the emotions kind of follow this trend of anger frustration and kind of bewilderment so thank you yeah thanks for sharing anybody else or anybody online wants to share the recollection Hi, Ellen. Exciting start to this. Uh -huh. I <laughs> yeah. recognize your voice, Jen. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so like just yesterday um, with with my daughter, who's kind of been in a process of separating from her person and then uh, but back and forth and the back and forth has, left, you know, 
um, was really confusing for me. And, um, but then what happened was relating to Sue, the rage <laughs> and um, my own because of, uh, because I got invested in outcomes. So that kind of startled me and uh, uh, kind of, I had to, but at least, you know, the difference is now I recognize it and I was able to do something about it. So, but still completely spinning out and confusion, you know, so there's that. Thank you. Yeah. So that seems loud. Um, I think that uh, one of the things that I find recently, I was studying and I got confused. I felt really tight. Like everything, just like my body tensed up, my back tensed up, and my mind also tensed up. Like I, I couldn't uh, get the space to be able to figure it out for a little bit. So I, once I recognized that that's what's, what I was, that I was being confused at that time, then I could take some steps to try to slow down and go step by step, but it took a bit to be able to actually say, oh, this is actually, I'm not understanding this and I'm not just tense, right? It just sort of started the tense tension built. And then I, I got to a point where I just had to do something else because I figured out that I was confused and I didn't know what's going on and go back and reread, slow down, make a little flow chart. So you know, a little bit different than personal interactions. So. Maybe. Thanks, Connor. Hi, Ellen. Hi, uh, I like that little chill lounge back there, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Utilizing the couch. Uh, so Connor and I were back here whispering about this, and there was a situation where I had a smash and grab by the park, and Connor was with me. And when when I came out to the car, it like it took a second for my mind to even recognize what was going on with my window being shattered. And um, so I had a very different experience than Connor. Like I didn't feel tight. I felt very loose and very open and like there was a lot of space, but it was, it was like I had nothing to hold on to, and I couldn't form a thought to start a direction. Like I was literally just kind of frozen in open space, not knowing where to go. And Connor luckily said to me, Hey, why don't we go sit down and get you a glass of water. And just that little bit of direction felt so helpful and supportive because I literally just felt I, I had nothing to, to hold on to in, mm. in terms of direction or anything. Interesting. Thank you. Hi, Ellen. It's Linda. Hi. See you. So um, <clears throat> I had this experience. I was so proud of myself in Europe that I was getting on the right trains and going in the right direction. And I was in Belgium and I got on the train that I was supposed to get on. And I checked with the conductor and asked a couple of people if it was the right train. And they said yes. And then 45 minutes later, when I was supposed to get off, I realized my stop wasn't coming up. So I got off and I'm like, how could that be that I, I couldn't have possibly have been on the wrong train? It turns out that at my stop, the train splits. They split the train and one train or part of it goes one direction. The other part goes the other direction. So I was on the right train, but I was on the wrong part. Um, <laughs> so I was stuck in some part of, I think it was, I don't know if I was in France or Germany. I, I was even confused about that. I didn't know what direction I went and no one spoke English there. Um, so I was totally confused. Mm -hmm. I knew I was going to miss my connecting train that I paid an extra seat for. Um, and I, I guess kind of, I felt like, um, I guess the word I would use is that groundlessness, mm -hmm. like, Oh, where do I go from here? What do I do? And I'm I'm not sure how to proceed. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. I feel a little panicked. Yeah. Wow. Scary. I hope you made it eventually. 
it's a long story. Okay. All right. Well, we'll follow there. up afterwards then. <laughs> Anybody else? Last call. Thank you. I think it's, it helps. It's a good context. Um, so anyway, I didn't properly introduce myself. My name's Ellen Wolf. For those I haven't met, I'm a student at Lions Roar with Lama Yeshe Jimpa, and um, I'm excited about this talk. Uh, I talked to him about it some, and and of course got guidance from Lama Jimpa about some of the content. And I also have some other sources. Some of you will recognize these books. Can't share very well on the screen, but Crystal Clear. Probably some of you have read that. Um, some of these others that I only have on Kindle. I mean, you'd think there, there's a lot to read about this stuff, turning confusion into clarity. So that should have said it all right there. And confusion arises as wisdom. It's not like we're without Dharma materials on this topic. One, um, one more that I found particularly useful, and I'll talk about these some more later. Zochen Essentials, The Path That Clarifies Confusion. I really appreciated some of the discussion in this book, if you haven't seen it before. So um, I got actually motivated by this talk from Connor's talk on fear, because when Connor was presenting on fear, I realized that I don't really have a lot of fear. I didn't feel like, you know, I've learned to stay away from high places because I do kind of have a fear of heights. I don't do zip lining and things like that. But I don't experience fear often. I thought, well, what do I experience? And I experience confusion a lot. So that was uh, a strong motivation for me preparing this talk. And then um, one other thing that sort of stimulated my talk was one time I was talking with Lama Jimpa about difficulties with administration. And some of you know, that's one of his favorite practice areas. And I said, Lama, maybe someday you should do a talk on being at your wits end and I started thinking, what is a wit's end anyway? But I think essentially it had to do with confusion about you want to make something happen and you're having trouble making it happen. So um, in terms of the talk, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the kind of uh, mechanisms behind uh, confusion from a sort of a neuroscience perspective, psychological neuroscience perspective based on some articles that I've read. Um, and then talk eventually, well, to distinguish a little bit between confusion and frustration, because I think sometimes we don't know exactly where where we are in that spectrum. And I know, Sue, you said you felt frustrated when you really looked at your confusion and then um, finish the talk with a confusion from a Buddhist perspective and what the path says about um, clarifying the confusion and how it actually works. So, um, a lot of times I think we experience confusion as a kind of disagreeable experience. You know, it's not necessarily a pleasant experience. And I know for me anyway, sometimes I feel like I'm kind of like wasting my time or I wanna be doing something and accomplishing something. And here I am sort of spinning in this state and not getting to where I wanna go. Uh, but is confusion really an emotion? You know, I don't think we strictly think of it as an emotion. Interestingly, there was a, a research project done by two professors of psychology, um, Paul Rosen and Adam Cohen in 2003, and they examined students looking at, uh, they had students actually look at facial expressions and record what experience they thought the, the person whose expression they were looking at was experiencing. And even though um, confusion isn't strictly considered an emotion and even sort of broadly considered an emotion, it was by far the predominant reaction that the students recorded that they saw in people's expressions. So there is a lot of confusion floating around and people experience it and it has sort of unique characteristics to it. So, I mean, it is something. So let's talk a little bit more about what it is. And, Usually confusion arises when we encounter some situation, and I heard this in some of your stories, some sort of stimuli that's new and different, and where our ability to make sense out of it using our current strategy is low. So there's sort of a gap between the situation we're experiencing and what we currently comprehend. And it seems to involve an experience where we have, we reach a limit of our cognitive ability for that circumstance. 
And sometimes that cognitive obstacle can be so great that we lose our motivation to work through the problem. Um, when it's too big of a piece of a puzzle, for example, it might seem that it's not worth the effort of working through to sort it out and, and you can give up. And um, there's even a, a phrase, hopeless confusion. You know, when you're so confused that you just walk away from the circumstance, for example. And these are characteristics of what's known as negative confusion. So confusion that's not really productive at, at accomplishing what you were setting out to do. And confusion and frustration are sometimes conflated, even though they're relatively similarly, similar conceptually. Um, and I think we tend, sort of common knowledge, to distinguish confusion from frustration, where frustration is accompanied by anger, for example, <clears throat> more strong negative feelings. And Sue, you said you felt anger arise and, uh, associated with your frustration. Um, and I know when I started thinking about confusion for this talk, I started actually paying attention to, to what was going on when I felt confused. And a lot of times I think I didn't really feel confusion. I felt what I would label frustration. And I often did have some anger. And then sometimes if I really investigated it, it was just because I wanted things to go the way I wanted them to go. And they weren't doing that. Or I wanted them to be easy. You know, or like you said, Patty, I, I wanted to have a conversation with my friend and have it go like I expected. And I would get a little bit frustrated or angry when it didn't work out that way, which is, seems kind of silly, but that's just the way it works with us. Um, but interestingly, the research shows that confusion and frustration are, are not that different. They work similarly. So I'm going to mention two studies. In 2002, 13, there was a collaborative study between Worcester Polytechnic Institute and Columbia University trying to distinguish between confusion and frustration. And um, they performed a, a, a study looking at students trying to learn algebra online. And then they looked at their facial expressions, their posture, and the actions they took within the software. And in part, the study was done to test whether learning when confusion is encountered is more productive than learning in a when one experiences frustration. And interestingly, the study found that both frustration and confusion can have positive effects on learning. And it, it was really the duration of the experience that influenced whether the outcome was positive or negative. So whether somebody experienced confusion or frustration, if they resolved it, in a relatively short amount of time, then it could be a positive experience. But if they stayed stuck in that state with all those emotions, then it, it had a, tended to have a negative outcome. So um, it more had to do with, again, how long they were in the state and not whether they experienced something that felt more like confusion than frustration. And then another study was done at the University of Pennsylvania in 2024, so um, recently. And they looked further into this, and they also looked at facial expressions. And now there's software tools that look at these facial expressions. There's one called Afdex, looked at responses. And these were of middle schoolers trying to learn about climate change online using this thing that Charlotte and I have talked about briefly before called Betty's Brain. I guess it's an educational app to teach, um, to teach about different topics. And in this um, study, they also did some pre-work. So they tested the student's knowledge before the learning encounter um, to see also what the outcome would be relative to how they went into the study. And one, one of the things I found interesting about this is that with both confusion and frustration, there's a high correlation with certain reactions. One is surprise. So 33% of the people that experienced confusion or frustration were surprised. Uh, the other one is was disgust, and I'll talk a little bit more about this. I thought that was kind of interesting. And then there's some other encounters like sadness and anger and fear, but those were much smaller, like 3%, 6% of the time. So when I heard this disgust, I thought, well, that's strange. And so I actually looked up what does disgust mean? Because I think of it as a real sort of almost like a dirty feeling or something. But disgust just means a feeling of revulsion or aversion to something that's unpleasant. And I think that's, for example, something that I felt when I got confused, like, I don't like it. I don't want it to be this way. 
So surprise and disgust were two things that came up a lot, like 30% of the time or more. And interestingly, they did find that prior knowledge had an effect on these experiences in a certain way. The higher the prior knowledge was of the students going into the learning experience, the more likely they were to feel this disgust feeling. So it's kind of like if you think you know what you're doing and then you encounter a situation where it's not going how you expect, you're more likely to be triggered in a negative way, which I mean, it's not that counterintuitive, but it means people that are sort of high functioning, uh, high performing, well-adjusted people may have these experiences a lot because we don't expect to have them. Kind of funny, I think. Um, and with the prior study, the disadvantageous learning outcomes were higher the longer the negative emotions persisted. So both studies point to the, I think, uh, um, a quality of emotional resilience that can be beneficial. You know, you go into a circumstance where you expect it to go a certain way or you hope for it to go a certain way and it goes a different way. And it can be triggering and triggering in a negative way sometimes. And if we can re regain our composure in that circumstance, we have a better chance of having it have a positive outcome. So um, I think this positive outcome thing is, is interesting because I would have never thought before I looked into this topic of confusion that confusion can actually be a good thing. There is this um, quality and this, they characterize it as positive confusion. So under the right conditions, confusion can actually act as a driver of success in complex encounters, complex learning tasks. Because complex learning tasks, they require us to do things like, oh, generate inferences or take something we've learned before and apply it to a new circumstance or explain things to somebody else or troubleshoot, problem solve. And that's that's kind of as opposed to to rote tasks, you know, things where you're doing the same thing over and over, just memorizing things. So complex tasks characteristically present learners with cognitive obstacles. And the researchers have found that when the learners respond to the obstacles by experience con experiencing confusion, we tend to invest more cognitive brain power in the effort. So the confusion can actually trigger us to work harder at it. It can motivate us to engage in a deeper kind of inquiry and a more thorough information processing, which actually increases your chance of overcoming the obstacle. So, I mean, there is something kind of a fringe benefit to confusion. Um, Especially, I think it's partic particularly useful, they say, when the task requires us to operate under a, a change in paradigm or conceptual shift to overcome some misconception or biased assumptions or um, prejudices in order to develop like a more sophisticated understanding or mental model of what's going on. So confusion in these cases seems to prompt a shift of approach so that people experiencing confusion are more likely to look for and adopt alternative strategies to the problem. So I, I, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, it Confusion as a mental state then not only helps us recognize and understand that we are facing a problem for which we have no easy solution, but it also triggers us to think more deeply as a result, motivates us to work harder and invest more mental effort in the problem and to maybe look at the problem differently or look at new ways or strategies. Feel free to interrupt if you, if you get tired of listening to me babble on. Um, just gonna take a talk a little bit just to mention neuroplasticity because um, research in neuroscience is slowly showing how confusion works us works with us to help us achieve these goals. And neuroscientists are arguing that encountering a complicated problem or obstacle in this context of learning a new skill, whether it's athletic skill, a language, how to play an instrument, it enhances neuroplasticity in our brains, which makes us more alert and focused, actually, and gives us then, therefore, a higher probability of succeeding. And I think it's interesting how 
overcoming confusion involves in a sense the same neurological pathways as are involved in meditate meditating or concentration training. So I guess that gives us all kind of a leg up on using confusion to our advantage. So what's the trick to having um, confusion be positive? I think a lot of it has to do with, and a couple of you mentioned this, not getting gripped. You know, when when you have the experience to sort of step back, think about it a new way. I know Michael said that, and um, a couple of the uh, others of you, Patty said, I decided to take a break and not push it in the conversation. So not getting gripped by the emotional response, and then also I think approaching situations with a very open mind you know sort of childlike mind beginner's mind so that we're open to having things be different than maybe we we think they are when we go into things um creativity is also tied a lot to overcoming confusion or using confusion in a productive way and then there's this sense of finding the right level of challenge and i think of it like that zone they call it where it's not too challenging and it's not too easy but there's the right amount of challenge and actually a study in 2019 which was documented as a study called the 85 percent rule for learning by robert wilson and, and colleagues and such found that the optimal degree of difficulty for stimulating the brain to heighten its focus without the learners giving up was that when they got the answer 85 percent of the time so if you're failing at what you're trying to do more than 15% of the time, the research shows that you'll tend to shut down, you know, and give up or, or be have your motivation adversely affected. So, and, and of course, like I mentioned with the other two studies, that the amount of time you're in emotional distress can affect the productivity of the confusion. So, um, you know, recognizing that confusion, I think, can be positive is helpful because then you can reframe the situation. You know, take a break, try to de-escalate the emotions and then rethink the way we're doing things. So rather than giving up and waiting for a solution to be presented, maybe we can embrace it and pursue it and, and, and kind of tolerate that creative tension and know that that's allowing our brain to stimulate Oh, in a way that will be helpful to learn something new. Any questions so far? Okay, Patty. Thank you. Thank you for saving everyone. Uh, Scott has a question. Mm. On to him. So Ellen, you had stated before that um, the more uh, higher functioning you are, the greater chance of confusion you have. So then isn't it by overcoming confusion that we're then getting into a loop of, oh, I've overcome this, I'm more higher functioning, now I'm going to be more confused. So isn't there a, a feedback loop there that happens? Well, I, I don't think it's strictly high functioning. I think it's just a preconceived confidence that your way is the right way is really the pro the problem, so to speak. If you go into something thinking you know everything about it or you know how it should go, then I think that's sort of the, the booby trap. But I mean, and this is something Lama Jimpa said too, right? That as you progress on the path, the Buddhist path, you don't get rid of your problems, you just get bigger problems. So I think as we learn to leverage things like confusion and think more creatively, intuitively about things, it just gives us the ability to take on additional challenges. Could it also, I'm sort of thinking back to fear, could it also mean that part of what we're doing is that we're refining where we have assumptions? So our For confusion sure. area is actually opening up to, oh, that's, you know, sort of a, a downward chain of that's a confusion, that's a confusion, right? Just being better at identifying it in a more refined level. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it'll, consistently if we went into things open-minded, like we don't necessarily know the answer to something, but we're here to explore that we would have better success and less adverse, you know, experiences from complex situations. 
Thanks. Thank you. I just um, just wanted to follow what Connor was asking about with your response to him about um, us um, about Connor saying how we refine. I, that gives me some hope, actually. <laughs> it really does. That's good. That's good. We can bring hope today. That's good. So I was going to shift really to Buddhist perspective now because a lot of us are on the Buddhist path. Um, and certainly a lot of us have a committed meditation practice. So we likely already have some level of faith that meditation can have the effect of clearing away confusion, at least on some general or broad level, you know, or helping us see what's true in things. Um, as as in the book, Crystal Clear, that I showed Julia, this sort of famous book, says the focal point of Vipassana training is to see what's real. And it also says, first of all, we have bewildered ourselves into samsara. So I think as our last little exchange, Connor and mine, we sort of go into things confused in a, the way, in a way the confusion is that we're, we're fixed in our own perspective. And so a different circumstance then sort of shakes us. So we go into life kind of from this bewildered samsaric perspective and the practice of Vipassana then develops the ability to see clearly the way things are. And, and Lama says something similar that at the core of our confusion, there's some unexpressed premise or demand, some unconscious bias. And that if you're taking a Buddha nature approach, you have to get to the truth by peeling away the obscurations. You know, as I mentioned, mine and all of this I learned was that I always want things to go my way, you know, and I get confused when everybody else doesn't sort of line up in the way I think it should go. So that was a nice little lesson. So Mahamudra offers um, some relief. Also, these books I mentioned, The Confusion Arises as Wisdom, Gampopa's Heart Advice on the Path of Mahamudra, teaches us to, to look into the nature of the confusion. In other words, when you feel when a feeling of confusion arises, you look into the nature of the confusion and you can't find the presence of anything that could actually be confused. And when you know this for yourself, he says, there's no more confusion and the misunderstanding is cleared away. I like that concept. Now it doesn't, for me, it doesn't always work like an instant antidote. I'm hoping that's a, something that with with the ongoing practice, it gets more sort of rapid or more quick as an antidote. And and similarly, the similarly the book turning confusion into clarity. In that book, um, we learn that recognition is what transforms our reality from confusion to clarity. And and maybe this was a little bit what Connor was saying. You know that if we go into it thinking that there are other perspectives, that that's part of the the trick already. Um, and uh, in that book, Minger Rinpoche does confirm that it's a mis mismatch between the way things are and the way things want to be that creates many of our experiences of confusion. I think the message is, is essentially that we must confront the full measure of our suffering and dissatisfaction. And this is this whole sort of, sort of samsaric state. Uh, as I mentioned, I found this book on Zochen to be particularly helpful. And this is this book here. I can't show it and read it at the same time, but it's by Marsha Binder Schmidt. She's married to Eric Schmidt, and they both, I think, do a lot of translation and have written some good works. And the, the introduction to this is what I found helpful because she kind of recharacterizes the path in a way that was sort of common sense or, or common language to me. Um, but one thing I think that sort of spoke to this directly was this, the four dharmas of Gampopa, and I'll read all four, Tibetan and English. Lo chu sudro war chin gi lop. Grant your blessing so that my mind may turn towards the dharma. Cho lam dru dro war chin gi lop. Grant your blessings so that dharma may progress along the path. 
Lam Trul Wa, Sheik Par Chin Gi La. Grant your blessings so the path may clarify confusion. Trupa Yeshe Suchar War Chin Gi Lok. Grant your blessings so that confusion may dawn as wisdom. So those last two sort of speak directly to this topic. And essentially the Dharma says when we combine the path with the view, meditation, action, and fruition, then the path can clarify confusion. This third Dharma, read it again. Grant your blessings so the path may clarify confusion. So letting the path clarify the mistaking, mistaken ways we normally relate to perceptions of our environment, our body, and our sense impressions. And, and especially with Tantra and Dzogchen, rather than continue the habit of insisting on solid reality, we're offered a skillful alternative. And Dzogchen contains instructions on Vajrasattva practice, mandala offering, and especially guru yoga. So involving these you know, empowerments and yidam practice, development stage, visualization of deities, recitation of mantra, feast, completion stage, these, these are said to purify that which prevents us from recognizing and sustaining the natural state. So these practices are intended to make our mind more pliable by peeling away the layers of sort of hardened tendencies, tendencies which is accumulated over time, of course. And, and we need to clear away what we unknowingly experience but cannot tangibly identify. So just this sort of hardened outer layer that makes us think that things are so solid. We're trying to affect the immaterial or sublime, which cannot be transformed solely by material means. So these guru yoga practices, for example, give us these inner ways of transforming to make these, these shells sort of dissolve. In technical language, we're clearing away three ignorances, karma, obscuration, and habitual tendencies. And these yogics expedite what's needed to gather, you know, also gather, namely condu um, conducive circumstances and merit. So... Again, when I talked to Lama Dimpa about this, he said something similar. We're trying to get to the subtle. He also said that in resolving confusion, we're eliminating extremes. You know, we want it to go this way and it ends up going this way. And those extremes usually are preconceived views. And so Lama also talks about not stripping out emotions, but rather bringing together emotions and ideas. And this could be really subtle. And through the tantric model, he said, we undo restrictions and mentioned, he mentioned knots that let us see the subtle and not just the extremes. So it's interesting, I think, you know, because when I first started and then I searched like searched these books for actually how do you get rid of the confusion? It just says you do the path, which, which is a pretty tall order, I think. But, um, you know, knowing actually how some of these things are working to help us, I think is helpful. Um, Lama also mentioned something to me that I think he said two weeks ago too, sometimes there's not just one clear choice, you know, we're faced some dilemma and we have to choose and there's not just one clear choice. So we have to choose between two things that seem sort of like equally as good. And how do we do that? That, uh, you have these subtle choices to make. And so the more we can get to the subtle layers, the more helpful it is. So un unfortunately, none of these feels like instant relief, you know, or like I mentioned, a short run antidote. And then I think the hardest part is that at the start of our path, we face this dilemma where we, we, we need to trust that the path will work, but we're, we're, we tend to trust more our old ways of being than we do trust this, this sort of esoteric path will help us get there. So there is this leap, um, and even in the Dzogchen book, they talked about this leap of faith to pursue the path. And Lama Jimpa talks about that leap a lot. If you listen for it, he'll mention that we may need to make that leap. We need to make a real effort to open ourselves up, and we could call that a leap of trust, so to speak. 
And unless we make such a leap, we might continue with our critical attitude and remain unchanged with those sort of fixed preconceived views. In the book, she says, we must be willing to surrender many of our preconceived ideas about the way things are. We must confront the possibility that our own mind cannot figure it all out and face the emotional challenge that we will have to rely on more than our own sense of reality in order to free ourselves from our predicament. So it's the same with these, I think, these seemingly conceptual practices. At one point, we take the leap and engage in them, even though we mostly don't even understand what we're doing. We just start doing them because the lineage teachers have told us that they work. So Lama, again, he, Lama also talks about this leap a lot. Like you have to get to that point and jump the crevasse, you know, make the jump, even though it doesn't feel necessarily comfortable. And then having integrated practice into experience, we can start to see differences in how we behave and how we see the world and how we see other people. And we start to loosen up these conceptual constraints that we have and our mind streams will hopefully become more supple. So I hope that's helpful regarding the path. I, I liked actually connecting some of the mechanisms of things we're doing with how it's working on us. So anyway, I'll conclude, um, just in conclusion, this confusion and frustration arise when our current understanding or knowledge doesn't match the current situation. The states can motivate us to expand, stretch, learn, and grow. But if the negative emotions have become too strong or they persist for too long without us resolving the confusion, then aversion can arise. So hopefully, hopefully the insights teach us to be more accepting of experiences of confusion, to identify quickly and de-escalate the negative emotions if they tend to arise and identify where we're seeking from an ego perspective what we want. That was my case, at least. The answer we believe, the way we think it should play out, the way we think other people should be, that even that we think it should be easy, you know, and it's not necessarily easy. And by being more open and letting go of fixed, these fixed positions, it's, I think, beneficial for resolving the confusion and for our path. So meditation is helpful, certainly, in clearing away what's not true. And then these other practices where we connect with the primordially pure help us to move from conventional fixed views and bolster our clear knowing. So I hope this has been helpful at letting us tolerate confusion, embrace confusion, be more open-minded and embracing the practice. And maybe we can have some more discussion so you can enliven up again. Any thoughts, reactions, reflections? Uh, just, uh, I, I like um, so, so much of what you talked about today, Ellen. It's a, it's a wonderful surprise <laughs> because when you, the topic of confusion is something I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, I feel confused quite often about so many things. But what I um, took away, one thing that's really standing out for me is, is uh, the length of time. Um, the length of time, how that can uh, change a uh, confused or shocked moment into something darker that's hard to work with, you know, if, it, if you let it go too long. So that, that's, I'm really glad for that reminder. I'm looking around the room and I, I'm, just checking if anyone else has a comment or uh, I have uh, Charlotte in the back, so I'll bring it to her. I, I think uh, one of the critical things to take away is the 8515 rule, right? And um, I think about this all the time, right? If I'm confused, what can I how do I break down what I'm having trouble with into smaller and smaller mm -hmm. bites? Because if I can get to a small enough bite where I understand it, then that increases my mm -hmm. feeling of 
you know, like, oh, okay, I got that. Then how do I link that to that? And how do I link that to that? You know, kind of like Legos for adults. I mean, well, don't even get me started. I love Legos still. But, um, but you know, I did not grow up. I, I exactly started kindergarten in California the year we stopped teaching music instruction. And I graduated the year that we realized that was a mistake. <laughs> so the next year they started teaching music. And so I missed out on all of that. And uh, I'm learning music now as an adult. And it's pretty funny because I will get really frustrated when I can't get what I think is a simple song. And uh, my teacher is really kind because he continues to break it down into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, sometimes even just a quarter note. And then I'm like, oh, I get it. <laughs> and then I can build from there. And so I love that you brought up the 8515 rule because I think it helps bring down our level of frustration to where we can have that childlike mind and really start to see things from a beginner's perspective again. Cause you know, I'm, I, I just think you're, when we're in that state, we're so much more open to being learners and not preconceivers, right? This is how it goes. So I just want to thank you for bringing that up because it, it just seems to really it seems to really work in my life if I if I think about it, just break it down smaller, 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 smaller till I get it. That's good. Maybe I'll just pose a thought question because it seems to work well, you know, and I used to do that when I ran long distance runs, just break it like first third, the second third or the next mile. But I wonder how that works with relationships, you know, I wonder how it works like if you have a dyad like Michael and his father, Patty and your friend, or we have these groups, dynamics that lands where like when we're trying to do these events or whatever, it'd be interesting to think about how we can make those challenges a little bit smaller. Um, seems a little bit harder to apply to interpersonal dynamics, how to, you know, limit the scope. I guess you just don't try to take on too much at once or something, but I don't know, maybe other people have ideas about that. Thanks, Shola. Sue's got one. She's like, I think I want to say something, but I'm not sure, kind of think. Um, uh, there's a there's two more people with a, a, a comment or- Great. I just want to say that it's um, been very helpful to have uh, a strong um, encouragement that our practice is going to work, even though we may still be confused a great deal of time, angry, frustrated, whatever. Um, the more we train the mind, the more we train ourselves to be open, calm, centered through the meditation practices. I think this also helps in the interpersonal relationships, because if I'm having a confusion or challenges in an interpersonal relationship, and I can own it for myself and sit with it and calm myself and look at the realities better clearly, then I can approach the interpersonal thing one step at a time. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate that, that in um, encouragement to even though you don't see the improvement right now, to believe that it will be there with the practice, so, the intense practice. So thank you for that kick. <laughs> You're welcome. So um, thank you, first of all, it was really, I knew I wanted to come and hear this talk, but I didn't know why. So I guess I was confused as to why I wanted to be here. And I'm not Perfect. Here so much. Um, I I when you had us do that first exercise, that meditation, immediately just transported me back to early memories and like childhood, early life, and uh, it was pretty emotional. I was going to share that earlier, but I got really emotional and um, didn't really even have to try to come up with a specific thought but without going into that too much I have held quite a bit of resentment and anger and not great emotions holding on to those from the early life of lots of confusion 
um, without direction. And so many things you said today were really interesting but when you started talking about neuroplasticity and um, some of the good traits that come out of confusion uh, that I, I really never put those two things together before. So it took me today from uh, quite painful memories to like, okay, different perspective and some really um, things to be grateful for in my present day, maybe born from some painful stuff, but like super transformed that confusion for me in just an hour today. So thank you. That was super helpful. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Yeah, I think it raises an interesting question too, kind of about trauma, right? Because we, a lot of us have these sort of ingrained old um, stress, tension, anger, or something from old confusion. And I wonder if that has the same sort of, it probably does aversion creating quality to it if we can figure out how to heal some of that, um, you know, or maybe just knowing that, that with that adverse, those negative experiences with us dwelling on them, that they're hurting our ability, you know, to uh, be open-minded about things. Maybe that'll be helpful in itself, but that's, that's interesting, you know, to give some more thought to maybe about how the old, the old injuries and the old confusions play into all this. So thank you for sharing that. Andrew's got one online. I see. Hey, Ellen. Hi, hey, Andrew. I love your talks. They're, uh, I love how you always start with kind of conventional neuroscience and move us into the Dharma. I appreciate that. Um, I was thinking about the taking the leap um, and uh, that feeling of kind of almost terror that you have before you take that leap. And I, I definitely think confusion often precedes it. And I was thinking about children um, as just before they make a developmental leap, there's all this frustration and, um, you know, they might be tantruming. Um, it's like they have this skill, but they, they don't know that they have this skill. And then they finally just try it out. And then there's this and then things get better for a time until the next place to have to take that leap. And so I think it's kind of like a, maybe a, a optimistic or positive way to think about confusion can be we're moving from our fixedness, right? I mean, people that just stay stuck in their fixedness that they're right and everyone else is wrong, those are very bitter human beings that um, are always looking for something in the world that the world's not giving them. So maybe our confusion can be a sign that we're moving past our fixedness in some way. What do you think? Is that? I, I like that. I mean, I, a couple of things I noticed from what you said is probably it's not just children that are having the temper tantrums. I mean, we, we hide them better, right? But I, I have them kind of little internal temper tantrums when things don't go the way I want them to, too. And so I like what you said, because as a grown up, you can kind of watch your kids go through these developmental stages. You know, but we don't usually watch ourselves do that. We, um, but as we're doing this, especially if we can overcome the confusion and go to the next step, then we're actually maturing too, right? And it's just harder to see it in ourselves. So I like that. So cool. Cynthia, who's been listening, just handed me a quote from one of her uh, favorite authors, John Dos Passos. Doubt is the whetstone of understanding. So just thought I'd share that. That's good. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for tolerating me. I would have liked to be there in person, but... Not you were, it feels like you were or are <laughs> bigger than life. It feels like you're right here with us. It really does. So, uh, Dirk's got a question hand up before you go to prayers. You're muted, Dirk. Sorry, first I had to fix my video and then my I was muted. Uh, I uh. It's an interesting topic because I was really experiencing thinking about this yesterday 
Well, you know, I've spent 40 years solving problems on computers under high pressure. So you, you my, my first reaction is always panic. I'm not going to be able to do this. And I was noticing yesterday that I was trying to solve something that I had to do on a website. And I was having that panic. I just laughed at myself because, you know, I mean, I've been doing it for so long. And I, I always and I always have this feeling that it's impossible. I, I'll, I'll never be able to figure this out. And then and then and then the whole world, you know, my whole world's going to collapse. I, I feel that way all the time. Uh, but but it's OK. You know, it's I've, I've learned long ago really to let it just sort of be there with me. Without it stopping me. Now, I don't know when that happened uh, that I learned how to do that, but. But it's it's a it's this thing where uh, okay you've got the panic I'm not going to be able to figure it out it's outside of my skill it's beyond me I'm not smart enough oh well just work on it anyway just just do it anyway that's, so so that's that's my little thing that I learned is to just let it be that way and then and then to realize really how ridiculous it is that I have these. That ridiculous, it's kind of ridiculous feelings, you know, they're just uh, my childhood coming back and yet yeah, screaming at me. That's all it is. Yeah, that's great. I mean, and what's great, I think a couple of things are great about that. One is that you can be gripped to just go forward anyway. But the other is that the leap doesn't have to be some big, huge thing. It can just be, well, okay, I guess I'll go for it anyway. You know, okay, I guess I'll go for this. And I guess we'll go for that. You know, it just can be the way we roll, you know, with life. So it doesn't have to be a huge jump off a mountain sort of thing. So that's great. Yeah, it's not like, oh, everything's okay now because I've come to this conclusion. You see, everything is still kind of, you know. Messed up? <laughs> Hard. Messed up but yeah, but but it's okay. It's it's like not a, not that big of a deal. Yeah, thanks. Well, that that uh, was well worth waiting for to hear from Dirk, wasn't it? <laughs> so now uh, we'll do dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chen Rizik, Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always perishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Lo Song Drakpa, I make requests at your holy feet. So um, I have a, a couple of announcements. So uh, the first one is related to next weekend. Um, well, actually, the first one's related to Tuesday, the 100th anniversary of um, Talk Openly. I hope I'm saying the right title. With Jack and Daniel online, they have a talk show where they talk to various people and also interview well, they interview people and they also have conversation about Buddhist topics and bringing it to life. And so that's on Tuesday at 7 o'clock on Zoom, and the link is on the Lions Aurora Dharma Center website. So I'm going to join them because I'm I just they're such wonderful people and fun to listen to and talk with. And then um, the second announcement um, is I put a sign up sheet for um, Geshe Gendon. Uh, Next Saturday, you don't have to sign up to attend. 
his chaplaincy workshop at 10 o'clock, but Susan Farrar is organizing um, Darshan's, which is it's like a one-on-one -on -one meeting you could have with Geshe Gendon, and he doesn't have a whole lot of those. So uh, she left her um, contact on the um, last week's Roar newsletter, but you can also uh, sign up on a sheet that's in the in the in our center. Oh, oh, I oh I thought I put it in there. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, so uh, there's that, and then um, on Sunday, uh, Geshe Gendon will give a talk on a special book about mind training, and uh, that'll be so interesting. He once visited us and did a talk about. Um, uh, the eight verses of mind training, I believe it was called, but is that right? And so he's, you know, he's just so uh, down to earth and yet he practices so diligently. He's uh, uh, just a real honor to have him for our guest. So, uh, and then everybody by now should know that the last two weeks of October, Geshe Gendon will be in Sacramento. I mean, excuse me, Geshe Sewang and uh, three of his friends from Ladakh and, um, that's very special because he's going to make a sand mandala, a medicine Buddha sand mandala here at Lions Roar the last week of October. And then the third week of October in, at Spiritual Life Center, he's going to make a compassion, a Chenrezig sand mandala. So I, I would encourage you to go to both of those events. All right. That's all I have to say. <laughs> so unless um, someone else here has uh, some. Oh. So uh, Connor reminded me, we have a very dear friend named Tenzin Choki, and she uh, is uh, just a remarkable person and, and friend. And she was going to come on the 13th of October, but she's going to reschedule with us. And Susan's coordinating that with her. I think she might not be able to come till springtime, but um, we'll, uh, as soon as Susan has a specific date, uh, she'll do a write-up most likely, and we'll put it in the roar. So, yeah, so I know that's uh, disappointing for us, but she she will be here. We just don't have a date set yet. So, okay, okay. So thank you everyone. Thank you everyone for coming. And remember, meditation is offered almost every day of the week here. And uh, and and join me with Jack and and Daniel on Tuesday if you can. Thank you so much. Thanks so. all. Have a good day. Bye, El. Everyone says thank you. Mel. Oh, my God.